Well, hello everyone. Welcome to Monday. Um, my name is Carol Wyatt Evans and I'm the Chemicals and the Environment Agent here at the Extension Office in Sarasota County. Um, I'm joined today by my co-worker Sarah Bostic and our Sustainable Ag, who is our Sustainable Ag Agent, as well as our colleague Mindy, who does an amazing job of monitoring the chat box. Um, I, I can't imagine somebody who could do that, do a better job at that. Um, our communications guru is Kevin, uh, who takes these, these presentations and uh, gets them turned into uh, you know, watchable videos and loaded up on our website. Uh, we also have a weekly blog, blog associated with this series, so please check out our website um, and you can go to any um, of our blogs, you can go to any of our, our edible gardening series that we've already, we've already uh, have loaded up on the website. And we also send out the weekly resource list. But I want to say thank you all for joining the Edible Gardening Series today, um, offered every Monday from noon to about 1230 at 1 o'clock. And this week's topic is on aphids. Um, I'll spend a little over 10 to 15 minutes discussing that topic. Um, and during that time, go ahead and put your questions, if you have one, into the chat box, and um, we'll, we'll start answering them as soon as, as uh, we're done with the presentation. And it doesn't have to be specifically about aphids. You can ask any question that you have about gardening. So without further um, delays, let's go ahead and get started. So this webinar series came from hearing over and over again from county residents that they're really frustrated trying to get a, uh, their garden started in Florida. So these are either customers that are new to gardening, have been trying to garden, or people who have actually just moved from out of state. Gardening in Florida, as well as other locations, can be very difficult, but the rewards can be amazing. Um, so this series grew out of that need for more information around gardening. And being Extension, we're excited about offering that support to the community. Um, also want to get out a shout out to our, our gardeners outside of Florida. Um, so happy to see you returning week after week to, to you know, try to, you know, assimilate the information that we're, we're giving out. And um, so happy to have you all here. So today, aphids. Aphids are an abundant insect pest in the garden and our landscape, and they can cause us major headaches. Um, but in nature's crazy little circle of life, um, aphids also happen to be the ultimate candy of the insect world. So natural enemies are the first line of defense in keeping aphids in check. And without them, aphids would truly devastate our gardens and our landscape. So today, aphids to, be, to eat or to be eaten. So um, we discussed the silver leaf white fly a few weeks ago, actually two weeks ago. So this week's presentation is dedicated to aphids. Um, aphids are the most abundant of the piercing sucking insects, which cause problems in the garden and landscape. Uh, this group of insects all have piercing sucking mouth parts called stylets, in which they use like a straw to suck the phloem, um, the phloem juices from the plant. Um, aphids are in the same order as whitefly and scale and mealybug, which makes their trying to control and treat them um, fairly similar, which is, which is a good thing. During feeding, aphids actually inject enzymes and toxins into the plant that causes a physiological change, um, such as leaf curl and distorted stunted growth. Um, aphids are also ca capable of vectoring certain viruses that can spread quickly through crops, such as tomatoes and squash and cucumbers. And although our series about, is about our small scale backyard gardening, uh, we have to be aware of these potential devastations that, um, that these insects can cause in both small and large volume crops. And that's why we wanna you know, emphasize the, um, de the destruction um, and devastation that these types of insects can, can cause. So aphids are incredibly diverse species. Um, there are over 250 species and they can you know, vary in colors from brown to yellow, green, orange, pink, or black. And they also can, they change colors depending on the season. So early in the season, say like uh, green peach aphid um, can be that bright, you know, fluorescent green color and it darkens in, the, uh, in, in autumn, right? After our gardening season's over. But adult aphids are about between uh, 1 32nd and 1 8th of an inch long. They're pretty small, but you can still see them without the help of a, of a hand lens. Um, both the immature and the adult stages are, are mobile throughout their life. Um, you know, we talk about some of the insects like, you know, like whitefly where they're not, the, the immature stage is not mobile, but with, with aphids, they are mobile, um, but they are slow moving when they do move. 
The green peach aphid is the most common garden aphid and the one that we'll be using it kind of as an example today when I'm referring to specific numbers. Um, but just remember that they don't all act and behave exactly the same way. So these are all kind of, you know, kind of, you know the numbers are coming from the green peach aphid, but um, you know, they're kind of generalizations. But besides the green peach aphid, um, some other of the common aphids are like the potato aphid, um, the melon aphid, the bean aphid, and the cabbage aphid. I unfortunately don't have a picture of a cabbage aphid on here, but they look like, like they look, they're gray a little bit, not hairy, but um, look like they're covered in a bit of cotton, but they're just kind of a grayish, ugly color. But I put these on here just to show you what a diverse, you know, how diverse the species can be. But um, back to cabbage aphids. Cabbage aphids are, are species that feed only on one plant family, but most of the other ant, uh, aphid species can feed on a whole range of, of different plants. Um, so, you know, there are some that are just host specific. Oh, and with this, I wanted to point out, um, you know, these are all aphids, but as you see here, there are two that are not the same, right? These are all natural enemies. So here's a parasitoid wasp, and then here is actually a lady, uh, lady beetle larvae. So um, that's, a, you know, that's good to show you that there's always going to be natural enemies around. So although aphids are quite easy to identify in most cases, um, there are a few characteristics that will help to confirm you know, exactly which insect they are. So aphids have a pear-shaped body and they have these real long legs and long and tanny compared to the body, as you can see here. Um, they produce honeydew on which black or, or dark colored sooty mold grows. And a quick review of honeydew, um, it's the byproduct of, of feeding. So piercing sucking insects tap into, tap into and drink the plant phloem, which is, is rich in sugars and carbohydrates. So they can't digest all that rich sugar, so they literally poop sugar, and that, that is called honeydew. So um, aphids also leave uh, cast skins on the leaf after they molt. Remember that they are insects, all of which have an exoskeleton, and they must shed their skin in order to grow, but this is only the immature stage. The immature nymphs shed their skin on their way to becoming adults. Um, most aphids go through about four molts before they reach maturity. Here you'll see, here's a, a nymph in the process of molting, and this is the shed uh, uh, cast skins. And they tend to stick onto the leaf because of that honeydew. So you, you, you tend to see these a lot. So um, the presence of these tiny white cast skins on the, on the plant leaf are evidence that there's either an active or a past in, uh, aphid infestation. Um, again, they tend to stay on that leaf because they get stuck in that honeydew. And finally, the last characteristic that is really um, noticeable are these cornicles. So um, these are cornicles right here. Uh, cornicles are, are unique to aphids, and although they tend to get confused with Circe, which can be found on many, many insects, um, Circe tend to be like, kind of think of them like uh, two tails. Um, cornicles are a pair of small, upright, backward pointing tubes at the end of the abdomen. They are sometimes compared or called tailpipes or dual exhaust systems as, as we would think of, as on a car. What these things, what the corn cornicles do is they, they um, release droplets of defensive fluid or also called cornical wax. Researchers still aren't quite sure and are completely in agreement of the function of these secretions but they are a sort of a defense mechanism because the aphid doesn't have many uh, defenses. Um, this is one of, one of those things. But cornicles are not where honeydew is excreted, but it is, it is commonly confused since that cornical wax does look very similar to honeydew. So aphid reproductive strategy. So aphids are prolific breeding machines. They have an amazing survival strategy, strategy in the way that they reproduce. There's two ways of reproduction for aphids. One is sexual reproduction, and the other is asexual reproduction, or also called parthenogenesis. Um, this is being able to produce eggs or live young without mating, um, basically clone, you know, making clones of themselves. 
but aphids speed up that process by producing only live young during the asexual rep reproduction phase. They just like heck with with creating eggs. Let's just go straight to the uh, to the uh, immature stage. Asexual reproduction happens in spring when it's warm and there's ample food source. Um, the mature females can birth up to 12 young per day, in of which all of them are females. So basically, they're mini means mini me's of their of their um, their mom. Some of these youngs can even be born pregnant, um, but they still have to reach maturity before they can give birth. However, um, immature females reach maturity in about seven days. So they can start pushing out more female aphids at that seven day mark. So there can be tens of generations in just a few months. So if you're doing the math, the result of one female in one day of producing 12 offspring, after one week, those offspring can then, produ can, can then produce 12 offspring um, per day. So if you think about it, within one month, that one initial female can be responsible for up to about 20,000 aphids. Um, so this is why in the spring and summer, aphid populations literally get out of control very quickly. Um, but during these peak growing times, if the food starts to dwindle or it starts to get too crowded on that plant, females will then give birth to nymphs that grow wings. Um, which then they can fly off to, a, they don't, they're not very good flyers, but they can fly off to another plant um, where they can, you know, they'll colonize and, and start, you know, continue with that, that asexual reproduction. But again, all of this, you know, even with that winged female in, in that spring and summertime, those are still through asexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction takes place in autumn. So if we get down here on here, so we're talking about autumn now. In autumn, when the plants start to wither and decline, right, that's when our, our gardens are starting to, to go downhill, the females start to produce both female and male offspring um, so that the colony can then begin to start reproducing through sexual reproduction again. Once, once they reach the adult stage, these reproductive stages don't have mouth parts. Um, and their only purpose is to mate, to lay healthy, hardy, viable eggs, to start that process all over again in the spring. So these healthy, hardy eggs allows that spring population to be extremely healthy and start producing offspring through asexual reproduction. So this is also why such a tiny bug can be so successful. But in all, um, female aphids live for about 45 days and they can produce between 50 to 100 aphid offspring during that lifespan. And there can be 30 or more generations per season. So um, this reproductive strategy uh, points to how they can overwhelm a garden in the absence of their natural enemies. So signs and symptoms of aphids. Um, so we know that aphids feed by sucking that sap from the plant. So the symptoms of aphid feeding include things like plant stunting. So since the, you know, the aphids feed extensively on that terminal growing in, it can stunt the plant. Leaf curl and or it, discolor, which is, an, which is a, you can get this white or yellow stippling. So basically like tiny dots on top of the leaves can also cause like leaf dieback or pre premature leaf drop. Distortion or deformed flowers or fruit also can occur, and some aphid species can actually cause galls to form on roots and leaves. So some aphids feeds, feed on different parts of the um, parts of the uh, the plant. But some of these the signs that aphids are um, are on the plant include those uh, the molts on the top of the plant leaves. Remember we we talked about this. So you're going to see this and. The reason why they're all about right here is because this is where the honeydew has dropped. And so those molts have dropped down and, and stick to that. Um, also gonna get that um, black sooty mold. So the sooty mold is a secondary symptom and doesn't directly injure the plant, but it can block the light to the leaves, reducing photosynthesis, which then reduces the plant's ability to feed itself. So it's gonna reduce the plant vigor and its, and its growth. And then ants. 
If you notice ants on your plants, then most likely you have aphids. Um, they harvest the honeydew and in turn they will protect the, the ants. So they even, they will actually even carry the aphids between plants if they're moving. So, and if that plant starts to decline, they, they help the aphids along. And then the most obvious, the um, aphids congregate on new growth tips and new lush, heavily fertilized plant growth. So as we see here, um, massive infestation, right? So the worst aphid damage is often found in young, um, young plants where the aphids can reach like incredibly high densities on young plant tissue. Um, this is gonna cause water stress, it's gonna decrease the growth rate, and it can actually quickly uh, kill off that, that new transplant if, if, if they're not taken care of. So um, there's a wide variety of host plants. Um, those include things like beets and broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, peppers, pumpkin, spinach, squash, <laughs> tomatoes, turnips, watermelons. I mean, basically um, just about everything can get an aphid feeding on it. Um, but they will also infest many of our plants in our landscape as well. So, um, you know, and weeds as well. So aphids are kind of all over the place. I'm um, very general in their, their host plants. So aphids and virus transmission. So green peach aphid is the most important vector of plant viruses throughout the world. Um, both the adult and the nymphs are capable of transmitting viruses, but the adults um, due to their size have a much greater opportunity of, of doing that transmission. Um, aphids, aphid transmission vir transmit viruses through their feeding secretions. And there's been recorded to be over 100 transmittable viruses associated with, with just the green peach aphid itself. So some of the most damaging of those viruses are um, potato leaf roll virus and potato virus, lettuce mosaic um, virus, cauliflower mosaic and turnip mosaic viruses, as well as cucumber and watermelon mosaic viruses. So if aphids if aphid infestations go unchecked, it can be it can dramatically reduce the quantity of the produce from that plant, or even cause that plant to um, stop flowering. So the presence of honeydew is going to cause sooty mold to form and also impact that growth. So you're, you got plants getting kind of a double whammy, right? And um, some studies have shown that. Uh, preventative application of either mineral oil or of a, or a vegetable oil to coat the leaves can reduce virus transmission. Um, they hypothesize that this potentially can, um, what it does, it might stop that virus from actually being able to um, attach to the, the aphid's uh, stylet, its mouth part. So therefore reducing that potential of vectoring that virus. Um, growers tend to rogue any of their plants to reduce that um, ability of aphids to spread that disease when they find that disease in, in their plants. And then a problem in Florida, when temperatures stay warm enough for the, those aphids to survive year round, many broadleaf weeds are actually um, a secondary host for aphids during winter. Um, so that virus pressure can actually stay high if, if both those aphids are, are not kept in check or the weeds aren't kept in check. Now, how do you control aphids? So you guys are gonna get tired of me talking about this, but integrated pest management. So employing management strategies early on and utilizing integrated pest management is a key to a successful garden. Session three is where we, you know, back in October, we were dedicated to IPM. So, you know, please go back and look at that. And your our basic um, IPM uh, controls are cultural, uh, cultural monitoring, biological and chemical controls. So we'll talk really quickly about those. So um, practicing good cultural methods means, um, you know, checking the garden areas prior to planting, start clean, remove and throw out plants that attract aphids, that you know attract aphids. Um, as always, keep weeds from taking over. Um, many are gonna harbor those, those uh, um, aphids, but they're also gonna harbor other um, insect pests as well. And avoid nitrogens, uh, fertilizers with high nitrogen. I cannot stress this enough, especially when you're dealing with aphids. Use slow release, low nitrogen, organic fertilizers or compost is the best. And then monitor frequently during aphid season. Um, so that spring and summer. And remember how quickly that those aphids can reproduce. So your scouting sh schedule should match the intensity of those insect populations. So at least twice a week. Um, aphids are usually spotty throughout the garden. So looking for signs of aphid and aphid damage is sometimes easier than actually trying to find the aphid itself. 
attracting beneficial. So plant flowers and other plants around your vegetable gardens that attract those beneficial insects um, whose adult stages are actually nectar feeders and then controlling your ants. So um, ants actually, you know, be, besides getting that honeydew, they're protecting them from their natural enemies. So they're actually gonna reduce um, what the, the natural enemies can do for you um, if those ants aren't kept in checked. And some things you can do is like to, you can place um, a sticky barrier around the, the base of the plant to stop those ants from being able to climb up that, that stem. Um, and then we'll talk about this on our last session, but um, uh, companion planting. Um, planting, uh, planting companion plants can help to either attract aphids and those attract away from your garden plants or they will repel aphids. aphids. Um, they can also attract beneficial insects that help control the aphids. Um, things like catnip, mint, and garlic are really good repellent plants. Um, but aphids are attracted to mustard and especially nasturtium. Um, aphids cannot resist nasturtiums. So plant these near your plants so those aphids are going to be attracted to them instead of to your new garden plants. So um, mechanical practice. Now, best thing, water, water spray streams will knock those, those insects off, those aphids off the plant. It may not kill them, but it may actually break their stylets off so that they can no longer feed. So they're basically like the walking dead. Also, once they fall to the ground, they become dinner for those ground beetles and those rove beetles. So um, water is, is basically like an alternative pesticide. Um, aphid traps. So either yellow sticky cards placed in or around the plants um, or one that has an uh, aphid pheromone, which the pheromones, they're these little lures. So there's, they're, um, they take the, the, the pheromone and put it in this lure. These may not be as efficient for aphids just because um, what ends up happening is because they have that asexual reproduction, those pheromone traps are actually not gonna be as, even as effective as just the yellow sticky card alone. Um, reflective mulch. Um, this reflects that sunlight back up onto the plant, um, which the insects do not like. And so this is going to decrease your aphid populations as well as your white fly populations. So you, know, you have to remember though to make sure you remove that, that reflective mulch when the temperatures start to rise because you might end up cooking the plant. Now biological control. This is one of my favorite slides. Um, Although aphids may hold that gold medal for produ you know, production of offspring, they also hold that top spot for being the favorite food of basically every natural enemy. Um, they are the candy of the insect world. Many other inverts eat them along with some wildlife such as like birds and lizards. Um, since aphids tend to feed at the terminal growing plant, so that top of that, of that uh, plant, um, they're exposed to the elements, but they're also exposed to their natural enemies. And so the natural enemies do a really good job of keeping them in check. Um, you really want to conserve your natural enemies. So check what's already in the garden or around the garden, but you can also purchase um, many natural enemies. But um, conserving natural enemies also means, you know, watching your pesticide and trying to refrain from pesticide applications. This even includes, bio, you know, biorational products. Um, when the natural enemies are out, don't be spraying because they're trying to do their job. Um, some of the natural enemies, the best ones of, of, uh, of aphids are your green and your brown lacewing. The adults actually feed on nectar, but their larval stage are voracious eaters. Now in here, here's a, this is a, um, oh, I'm sorry, that's not a green, this is a green lacewing uh, larvae. Um, hoverflies, so this is a hoverfly. There's all kinds of different hoverfly. They're also called flowerflies. The adults are pollinator, but the, the larval form is, is predatory. And these two are, um, are hoverfly larvae. Um, you also have the big-eyed bug, soldier beetles, damsel be beetles, ladybug beetles, right? Here's a ladybug larvae, here are ladybug eggs. Um, and then the most form of, uh, uh, effective form of control uh, is through the parasitic wasp. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So all of these are really common in your garden. So you want to check with, you know, check to see if they're around before you start trying other things in order to control your aphids. Now, um, this is just an example of what a ladybug can do against an aphid infestation. Um, after one week of, of lady beetles feeding on these aphids, all that was left were these, pup this is the pupil form of the lady beetle, right? So this is before, 
and here's after they've consumed all of it, and now these are going to pupate out into um, out into adults. So um, great, great form of, of biocontrol. So biological control is nature's free pest control service, and the best of the best are the parasitic wasps. One of the most reliant and effective form of, of biocontrol. They're really tiny wasps, and they get confused with gnats, so people want to kill them. But as you can see in the pictures, they're actually a little bit smaller than the aphid themselves. Um, the parasites, they, they parasitize the nymph at an early in-store stage so that then they have time to complete their life cycle inside of that aphid. So you want to, again, monitor for these biocontrols um, and don't use chemicals if you don't have to. And uh, so all of these are mummified aphids. These are fabulous um, for any gardener to see. As you can see here are some, um, you know, still some viable aphids, but they're probably also parasitized as well. Here we have one that's still alive. This is when it, the aphid has actually died. And now that, that, um, that uh, parasitoid is getting ready to, to hatch out. And this is one that's already been hatched out. The life cycle, just a quick overview here. Um, the parasitoid, you know, pierces and lays an egg inside the aphid. That larval stage is going to develop inside. All of a sudden, as it gets large enough, it, it goes into its pupil form. And so this is when that, that aphid is going to be die, going to die. That adult parasitoid now has cut out a hole and has, has emerged from that, that dead aphid mummy and now is going on to continue that life cycle. That's a pretty awesome thing. So finally, um, this leads us to the final step, uh, chemical control. Using biorationals is your best bet, especially for aphid control because they can build up insect resistance very quickly. Um, horticulture oils, insecticidal soaps, and um, neem oils work really well against aphids. But remember that water spray actually probably works as, as good as any of these. So um, the key is to spot treat when you do have to treat anything. You know they're usually on the terminal end, so you know, you're only going to want to spray that. You don't need to spray the whole plant because those aphids really aren't found throughout the whole plant. And one thing I found from, from the uh, Old Farmer's um, Almanac was that um, you can use a 70% alcohol, a one-to-one -one alcohol water ratio, and you can either spray that on the aphids or you can actually dab the leaves with uh, a cotton swab to get those aphids off. And I always hate eating with, with chemicals, so I want to end with something beautiful. So this is a bit of a twist. So um, we're going to cover these in our very last session of this series, um, but that is companion planting. Um, and a good example for uh, aphid control is planting crepe myrtles. Crepe myrtles attract um, the crepe myrtle aphid, and they serve as food for about 20 to 30 other beneficial insects. The aphids only feed on crepe myrtles. So they will not infest any other plant. But this allows those natural enemies to have an alternative source of food when aphid populations in our garden have, have decreased, right, have declined. Um, these trees also provide a fabulous source of nectar and pollen to many bees and other beneficial insects and pollinators. And they're just beautiful and one of my most favorite plants. Um, overall, it's a win-win for us, um, not so much for the aphid. <laughs> so, the best thing you can do though is really increase the biodiversity of the insects in your yard so you know that you're going to have these pollinators and these natural enemies around to help you out in your garden. So it truly is a, a buggy bug world so um, use that to your advantage. With that these are our resources from today which will be on the back of the pdf and also in your the, the uh, email going out to you and the end of our discussion on aphids. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Whew. Thank you for hanging out and sticking with us.